Okay. So oil spills. So today we're going to cover major oil spills, um, the oil spill to toolkit. So all the tools that we have to clean up oil, um, some ecosystem impacts and human health impacts. And the learning goals for today are to understand that oil spills are caused by accidents involving tankers, barges, pipelines, refineries, drilling rigs, and storage facilities. We'll learn that the Exxon Valdez oil spill was the worst oil spill ever in terms of damage to the environment, but the Deepwater Horizon spill was the largest oil spill in history. Okay. Um, and that we'll learn that microbes break up oil by using the carbon found in oil and that both short-term and long-term damage can result for humans that are exposed to oil and gas from these spills. So first of all, to define an oil spill. So what I mean by oil spill is the release of a liquid petroleum hydrocarbon into the environment, especially in marine areas, because these spills tend to be the most severe because they spread all over the place, but also on land. And these spills have to happen due to human activity in order to be considered an oil spill. So an oil spill is not um, natural release of oil from, um, from oil seeps, as we'll learn about in the next class. That's not an oil spill. Um, an oil spill does not have to be really large, though, of course, we always hear about oil spills. Um, you know, the ones that are the most damaging are the ones that we hear about. But any sort of spill... Um, that's caused by humans would be considered an oil spill. Oil spills might be due to the release of crude oil or refined product. So it could be the early stages of um, oil extraction, like basically straight out of the ground, or it can be product that has been turned into gasoline or anything like that. Um, and it can happen during the drilling process, during transportation. So oftentimes we hear about, you know, shipwrecks leading to oil spills or during storage. Oil spills into rivers, bays, and the ocean most often are caused by accidents involving tankers, barges, pipelines, refineries, drilling rigs, and storage facilities. Um, so these are almost always accidents. Um, they're typically caused by people making mistakes or by companies not following safety standards. Um, so usually for an oil spill to happen, since there are so many safety precautions, um, usually it's something that somebody does wrong that causes these oil spills. And as a result, oil spills often lead to new um, safety standards. So new ways to... Um, prevent these kinds of things from happening in the future. So I'm going to start off with, um, I guess, the bad news. <laughs> Two of the most major oil spills in the history of the United States. Um, really, two of the most major oil spills in the history of the world, which occurred in the United States, is how I should, how I should um, phrase that, because these are, these are severe in terms of worldwide disasters as well. Um, so the first one is the Exxon Valdez spill. Um, this one predates all of you. So this one occurred in 1989. And it occurred when an oil tanker, which was traveling from Alaska to, to California, ran aground on a shallow reef in the Gulf of Alaska in a shallow environment called Prince William Sound. Um, this was an accident that was caused by poor... Uh, Poor captaining of the ship, essentially, so the tanker was outside its normal shipping lanes in an attempt to avoid ice. Um, within six hours of the grounding, there were um, 10.9 million gallons of oil spilled into the ocean. So this spill happened pretty immediately after this tanker crashed. And um, despite ideal weather for about three days after the oil spill, cleanup was delayed. And there were a couple of reasons for this. One was that equipment was simply not ready to be deployed. And so this was something that could have been improved in our national strategy um, for responding to oil crises. But of course, Alaska is pretty remote. And so it's pretty difficult for this type of equipment to get deployed in a remote area. And so that was one reason that cleanup was delayed. 
Another reason that cleanup was delayed is that initially Exxon was a lot more concerned about recovering the oil that still remained on the ship than dealing with the spill itself. And maybe they thought that nice weather window was going to last forever, but the fact was after about three days, the winds picked up. We know Alaska generates storms. Um, the wind started to pick up and that clear weather window was over and the oil started to be transported all over the place. Um, in addition, by the time that cleanup really began in force, a lot of that oil had been mixed up by the waves and was converted to an emulsion, which is a mixture of water and oil. And when that happens, it's just like salad dressing, really. Like if you shake up like oil and vinegar in a salad dressing, um, that's essentially what an emulsion is. And um, when that happens, then that oil can't be burned off the surface. And so one response that they could have had was to immediately start burning that oil slick. Um, instead, by waiting, what happened was the oil slick could no longer be burned. And um, once that emulsion started to be transported everywhere, it became really difficult to be removed from sea surface or shoreline. So the Exxon Valdez spill was the worst spill ever in terms of damage to the environment. Essentially, this oil ended up making its way onto shore in some of the most pristine environments in the world. And um, nothing was pretty much nothing was done to stop it. So um, all of the oil that was spilled ended up making its way onshore to damage uh, marine and coastal environments. It affected uh, 2,100 kilometers of coastline, of which about 320 kilometers were heavily or moderately oiled, um, causing severe damage. There were immediate effects, including the deaths of as many as 250,000 seabirds, um, almost 3,000 sea otters, 300 harbor seals, 247 bald eagles, 22 orcas, an unknown number of salmon and herring. And those are just the things that we can count. Um, so likely it was causing death even beyond those numbers for a lot of organisms. Only 10% of the oil was ever recovered in cleanup. Um, so tens of thousands of gallons actually still remain out there in the environment. If you are, um, if you take a shovel out and you dig at certain sites in Prince William Sound, you can still find oil pooled underneath the, um, underneath the sand there. So there's still a lot of the oil out there. Um, we'll learn about how oil degrades over time. And so there's a natural process by which that oil disappears. But over time, the easy, easy to degrade bits kind of get um, worn down. And so over time, it gets harder and harder to get rid of what remains. And so that oil is going to be out there for quite some time. And there are lasting impacts to the environment. So the Pacific herring fishery remains closed. Um, it has never opened back up. The Pacific herring population has never recovered after the oil spill. And there are some populations of whales and seabirds that have not recovered and have essentially been on a slow decline to um, extinction, including a couple of populations of orcas um, and several different species of birds. There are a number of birds and organisms that have recovered. Um, the most recent to be considered recovered were um, the population of sea otters in that area are now considered fully rebuilt to um, pre-oil spill standards. So that's, that's good news too. Time does heal to some extent. Okay, so um, the Exxon Valdez oil spill was the largest oil spill to have occurred in the US until the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill, which occurred in 2010. Um, since then, the B BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill has been the largest oil spill in history. Hopefully we will never have another one larger because it was very damaging. Um, so the Deepwater Horizon um, oil rig was built in deep water, as the name implies. It was built in 1,600 meters of water to drill an exploratory well, well around 5,000 meters into the seafloor. And so um, this is the type of oil rig that's trying to access harder and harder to reach oil, um, oil reserves underneath the surface of this or underneath the seafloor. So increasingly, we've had to push these rigs further and further out into deeper and deeper water. And this is one of those deep water rigs. 
The reason for the spill was actually an explosion. So on April 20th, 2010, there was a high pressure um, bubble of methane gas that rose from the well and exploded when it reached the platform surface. And shortly after that, a couple of days after rescue crews were there putting out the fire, the platform actually sank due to the damage um, of the explosion. And almost immediately after that platform began to sink, um, folks started to notice an oil slick beginning to form at the surface, which was evidence of oil leaking from below. Oil ended up flowing out of that wellhead for 87 days. Um, it was almost impossible to stop. It took many, many, many different efforts to cap it. And a total of 210 million gallons of oil were released into the water. So it's a huge amount of oil, way, way more than um, Exxon Valdez. So what were some of the causes for this? Well, an investigation, of course, was launched after this with it being such a damaging um, environmental uh, catastrophe. And an investigation found that there was, um, the accident was caused by managers misreading pressure data and they gave their approval for rig workers to actually replace heavy drilling fluid in the well with seawater. And that seawater was not heavy enough to stop the flow of methane up the pipe. And so there was a lot of pressure and they ignored it and they didn't do anything to stop that pressure from traveling up to the surface, um, causing the explosion. In addition, um, perhaps even more damaging, there are on these wellheads a number of safeguards to prevent, um, you know, in case, in case the platform does explode or the pipe is severed or something, to prevent oil from continuing to leak into the environment. And these are called blowout preventers. And so they're designed to stop leaks at the base of the pipe, and the one on the Deepwater Horizon um, pipe failed to seal because the drill pipe actually buckled when the platform exploded. And um, to this day, we don't know why exactly that happened. The drill pipe is not supposed to buckle. It's made of some of the strongest materials around. Um, so that's something that might have been um, kind of like severe bad luck. During this oil spill, there was a substantial amount of dispersant used. And um, we'll talk a little bit about dispersant in the following slides. But what's interesting about um, dispersant is that it causes oil to sink rapidly in the water column. So instead of rising all the way to the surface, um, there are droplets that form and allow this dispersant to sink and um, kind of spread throughout the water column. But in this case, um, the dispersant usage, it was applied right at the site where the oil was entering the water at the wellhead. And it caused the oil to sink rapidly into, um, into the water column and form this plume, this underwater plume. This underwater plume spread um, essentially all over the place, like a plume would spread at the surface. And eventually those droplets spread, um, sank down onto the sediment and sank rapidly into the sediment. And if those droplets did make their way to the shore, they also sank rapidly into beach sand. And due to the burial of these droplets um, and the lack of sunlight reaching those droplets, degradation of the oil was actually slowed due to the use of dispersants. So even though folks responding to this tragedy were trying to um, disperse the oil, so it wasn't actually causing an oil slick that oiled like, for instance, um, marsh grass, they ended up causing another environmental catastrophe by keeping that oil away from sunlight and not allowing it to degrade properly. So this is a classic picture um, that came out of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill of the oiled pelican. Um, the most devastating impacts of this oil spill were the the loss of life of of sea life in um, in the Gulf of Mexico, and it was it was pretty it was pretty drastic. Um, how many birds and marine mammals and fish were oiled from um, this massive oil spill? We know how productive the Gulf of Mexico is. Any sort of oil spill of that magnitude is bound to kill a large amount of wildlife. Um, so oil plumes 
killed a number of things. Most notably, they killed large expanses of deep sea coral because that oil was being distributed into deeper waters. Um, the underwater oil plumes actually, um, as they passed, they killed any pretty much anything that was on the seafloor, but especially sensitive organisms like deep sea coral. Um, there were impacts for years after the oil spill. So in addition to all the loss of life that occurred during the response to the oil spill itself, for years after the spill, dolphins um, were washing up stillborn. Many dolphins that did survive the spill had signs of liver disease, pneumonia, lung damage, or underdeveloped lungs. Fish were being caught with deformities and lesions. There's a substantial amount of oil that's expected to still be out there along the sea floor near the, um, near the spill site and along the path where the plume traveled, um, which may be causing additional impacts, um, though these are the ones that are large enough to have been measured. One good thing that came out of this oil spill is that the settlement that resulted in it is being used pretty much directly um, to fund sorely needed research and restoration in the Gulf of Mexico. And so um, if there has to be a silver lining, it's that because of this oil spill, we now know a whole lot more about the Gulf of Mexico that may be used to prevent future oil spills from being so catastrophic. So this spill made it really clear how little we actually know about the Gulf of Mexico as folks were trying to respond to it and trying to get the needed information to decide where the oil was going and what management actions to make, they really didn't have the information they needed. So hopefully this never occurs again, but if it does, um, the hope is that we'll have the information that we need to, to make the right decisions. All right, so let's talk about what, um, we can do to respond to an oil spill. So what are all the tools in our toolkit that we can use to respond to an oil spill once it's happened? Um, first of all, we have booms, which are a temporary floating barrier that are used to contain a spill. So here, um, some booms are being used to protect islands from being oiled. And the idea is that this would provide a barrier and the oil would move around these islands rather than um, rather than oiling all of the marsh. They can be used as a barrier, a deflector. Um, there can be absorbent material wrapped around them so they can actually be used to clean up the oil and they can be used to corral the oil into one location um, if it's going to be removed. Booms have a downside in that they're only effective in calm and slow moving waters. And so they might be great in something like a lake where you don't get a lot of waves um, but in the Gulf of Mexico, it's very, very, very rare that we ever have waves that are under about three feet. And that's about the limit to what a boom is effective, um, usually like zero to three feet. And so during the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, it was estimated that 70 to 80 percent of the booms deployed were ineffective in containing the oil just because the waves were too strong. And this is just normal wave activity in the Gulf of Mexico that was too strong. It's not very nice. Keep moving. Start locking them out. Okay, a skimmer can be used um, along with booms to actually clean up the oil. So it's a device for recovering spilled oil from the water surface. It separates oil from water and stores it for safe removal. And there are a number of different ways that the oil can be skimmed off of the surface. I'm not really going to cover that for this class, but um, generally, these are only effective in calm water and areas where booms can kind of corral the oil into one area. Um, so that way it can be easily skimmed off the surface in a large, um, in a large layer. Some types of skimmers can be easily clogged by debris, um, which is one downside. And also, during Deepwater Horizon, when we used a lot of dispersants on the oil, it was found that skimmers might not be as effective on oil after a dispersant has been used. Um, and I'll mention dispersants in uh, the next couple of slides. We could talk a little bit more about what a dispersant does. I know that term is appearing many times in this lecture. One possible way you can deal with oil is by burning. 
which is a controlled ignition of the spilled oil to burn it off the surface of the water. This is one of the quickest control measures to deploy and one of the best options in remote areas. And so um, in those first three days after the Exxon Valdez oil spill, this would have been the method to get rid of a lot of that oil slick. Um, that would have been the method to deploy. Unfortunately, this was not used until um, it was essentially too late. It does have downsides. Um, so burning oil produces a lot of pollutants. Smoke pollutes the air and it may impact human settlements, even settlements that are far away. And the burning doesn't get rid of all of the oil, so it does leave behind a residue that can coat shorelines or sink to the bottom, but a lot of the oil is removed by burning. And then dispersants, um, which here I'm defining as chemicals that break up oil into small droplets. So um, dispersants just uh, essentially, they act, um, they act to turn the oil into smaller bite-sized pieces that microbes can get at. Um, so in theory, the droplets get um, distributed throughout the water column and there's lots of surface area for microbes, microorganisms to attach. And those microorganisms can um, do their work and break down the oil. That's the theory. There is concern that dispersants, because they're chemicals, that they're toxic to fish, corals, humans, etc. And we'll see a little bit later that um, that concern uh, was, was likely well-founded. And then there's also the fact that they don't quite work as well as you would think they would in theory. So in practice, during the Deepwater Horizon, the oil droplets, as we saw, they were either distributed throughout the middle, middle water column in essentially um, an oil plume, or they sank to the seafloor and then much of the oil remains where it sank. Um, so out of sight, out of mind, I guess, and you don't really have that oil you know, oiling beaches and, um, and marsh, but that oil is still on the bottom of the ocean causing impacts for benthic organisms. So um, you're just transferring the problem to a different component of the ecosystem. Our next um, bit in our toolkit is bioremediation. And so bioremediation means promoting the growth of bacteria to clean up oil spills. Microbes will naturally break, um, break up oil by using the carbon that's found in oil. And um, you don't have to put any sort of special microbes out there to do this. There are microbes in the environment um, already in the background um, that will do this and those microbes will bloom. They'll increase in population size when there's oil present. So um, that's great. It's something that the earth has naturally that can help us deal with oil. Um, so what, what we do is we supply those oil eating microbes with whatever nutrients that are limiting their growth. And so we learned about limiting nutrients and those are the nutrients that um, prevent the growth, uh, the further growth of organisms. And some of those nutrients that can be limiting are nitrates, phosphates, and iron. And so we'll fertilize the beach um, with these compounds and the microbes will be able to um, increase in number and they're eating oil all the while. And so that can speed up the oil degradation. This was really effective for the Exxon Valdez cleanup. So here's a picture of an Alaskan beach before and after it was spread with fertilizers to help that oil um, eat up the oil, help the, help the microbes eat up the oil. So you can see that a lot of that oil has been removed by microbes. It doesn't take terribly long too. We're talking about something on the order of, of months. Um, so that's not, that's not too long. The last two are a little bit less technologically advanced. So you can use hot water and high pressure, um, essentially blast oil off the beaches into the water where it can be skimmed off. Um, this was very, very commonly used after the Exxon Valdez spill. It turns out that it is not very helpful. So it essentially, the hot water cooks everything on the beach, including the good microbes that would be there to eat the oil, um, likely doing more harm than good. And so this isn't really something um, that people use a lot today because it's not very effective. 
And then finally, if you're sitting there and watching your beaches be oiled, um, so many people are willing to help in these disasters. And so you can use manual removal where you use handheld tools or equipment to clean segments of beach um, that have oil that are pooled or oily sediments or oily debris. Um, this is really only useful when the oil pollution on the shoreline is light. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to get cleanup crews out there. So here's a picture of a massive cleanup crew during um, the Deepwater Horizon spill. Everybody helping to form bucket lines to get that, bu get that oil out of the water and um, into drums or barrels where it can be removed from the area. Some of you for your current events um, brought up a new study um, just just released in the last couple of months that um, talks about the weathering process of oil and changes a little bit what we knew, what we thought we knew about oil weathering. And so I wanted to bring that up now. Um, so the weathering process of oil refers to any physical, chemical, or biological changes that occur to oil as it spends time in the environment. So as it spend spends time in the environment, it'll break down in a number of ways, and that's known as oil weathering. And this new study um, indicated that the sunlight actually does a lot to weather oil almost immediately when it when it um, is put out into the environment. So within hours to days, the sunlight is able to weather oil. And this is through a process called photooxidation, which refers to chemical changes in a compound, like in this case, oil, due to exposure to light. And so essentially the radiation from light causes chemical changes in the oil and changes its form. Weathering is not always a good thing. So um, for instance, the weathering, this weathering, photooxidation, does not necessarily make oil less toxic. In fact, photooxidation makes oil more toxic. It's actually the cause for a lot of the toxic effects that we see in oil. Um, so it's producing free radicals, and that causes a lot of the lesions that we see on skin um, due to exposure to oil. However, weathering in general um, changes the, the form of the oil and photooxidation changes the form of the oil so it can be more easily broken down by microbes. So it's one key step in the bioremediation process. After photooxidation, oil is better able to be um, broken down by microbes. So in this image, you can see a lot of the different um, transformations that oil can go through. Um, a lot of these that we, a lot of these we've talked about already, like emulsification, where it's combining with water. We talked about dispersion, where it's changed into droplets. We talked about biodegradation, where microbes can be eating apart the carbon that um, that forms oil. Um, oil can also be evaporated. Obviously, spreading and drifting can occur. And then we just learned about oxidation. So lots of different ways that oil can be transformed. All right, I'm going to save this um, assignment for the end because I think I have one, one or two more slides, um, and then and then I'll see if you guys can can um, complete the assignment. Um, so uh, this is supposed to say oil impacts to humans. So this slide is on the impacts to people because we have had enough spills in our history that we can um, kind of see how they impact people both short and long term, especially after um, Deepwater Horizon. They, the U.S. government was able to keep track of a lot of the first responders to the oil, a lot of the people that were involved in the cleanup and follow their health impacts over time. And so while we've long suspected that exposure to oil and the chemicals used to deal with oil can cause long-term health impacts, now we are starting to have real data um, to show what those impacts are. So um, studies of biomarkers have uncovered irreparable harm to humans exposed to oil and gas from spills. 
Um, biomarkers, meaning any sort of genetic code that might be impacted by, um, by oil or gas, and any sort of um, specific, specific parts of the body that might experience physical damage. And so some of the impacts that have been noticed are respiratory damage, liver damage, decreased immunity, increased cancer risk, reproductive damage, and higher level of some toxic materials like hydrocarbons and heavy metals um, in the body, in the tissue. A recent study looking at Amazonian indigenous people's health markers following a spill was carried out in um, the Peruvian Amazon and this followed these um, folks four months after they were responding to an oil spill. And they showed that um, men who had been working cleaning up the spill had uh, more mercury in their body. So twice as much mer mercury in their urine as an average person. And mercury is very damaging to the brain and the liver. There was also concern that exposure to the chemicals and dispersants could cause long-term um, health impacts. Um, and I mentioned that when we were talking about dispersants is that being a, one of their downsides. And it turns out that following the people that were exposed to dispersants during Deepwater Horizon, it turns out that many of them have damage to their airway. So damage, um, for instance, to their nose or their nose tissues or their throat. Um, and also an increased number of lung and heart abnormalities. So um, it, it seems as though breathing these chemicals can, um, can definitely cause long-term issues. So your learning, learning goals to, for today were to understand that oil spills are caused by accidents. Um, these can occur in transportation or in pipelines and storage, um, in the drilling rigs, as we saw in Deepwater Horizon. You learned about two major oil spills, the Axon Valdez being the worst ever in terms of damage to the environment and the Deepwater Horizon being the largest oil spill in history. You learned about a number of different ways that oil can be dealt with or weathered, um, and uh, perhaps the most notable is that microbes can be used to break up the oil. They use up the carbon that's found in oil. And then you learn that there are both short-term and long-term damage occurring for humans exposed to oil and gas from spills. So that's the end of lecture. In the remaining time, how much time do we have? Let me see. Okay, so you guys have about eight minutes left. So if you can access um, this activity, simulating spills under um, 18 in class, um, go ahead and complete that now. It's just three questions, a couple of different websites to scroll through, um, and you can let me know if you have any questions as you work through that.